Dear friends and family in Christ, may you know the rich grace of our Lord Jesus and the joy that each and every day he will provide for all that you need. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we do give thanks to you for the many gifts that you give us each and every day. But most of all, we give thanks to you for your son, Christ Jesus. Help us always to use those gifts to bring honor to your name, to praise you, and to bless others through your gifts. Help us, Lord, in those times when we are ungrateful, to always know that you give us more and more abundantly than we could ever imagine. Help us, Lord, to look forward to a day when we are with you in your heavenly kingdom. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Money, money, money. Besides the fact that it is the main chorus and the first line of an OJ song, a 1973 band, for the love of money, we know that it seems to be the center of our lives, money. People who have money want money. People who don't have money want money. People who are worried about money worry about not having enough, worry about not having too much. Money seems to be a part of each and every one of our days. It seems to be what people think about when they're paying their bills, when they're, when they're getting ready to send their kids to college, when they're putting aside money for retirement. Money seems to be part of all of our lives. Somewhere I once read that Jesus in his parables, that he, uh, besides kingdom of God, the next most often thing, the thing that he talked about most often was money or wealth or the way we use it. It seems to inundate all our lives. And even if it's not a personal concern of ours, think about when you turn on the news. Think about how often an event happens. Well, riots again resume in Ferguson, Missouri. Look at the stock market the next day. The economists talk about how it's dropped or how it goes up and how it goes down. In the President's State of the Union address, how often does he talk about job creation, making money? How often does he talk about interest rates, spending money? How often does he talk about the national debt, losing uh, uh, where we place our money? Think about the way that money is part of our everyday lives. As you think about that, it's no surprise then that many times when we think about stewardship, we think about money. It's a, not a surprise that when we look at Scripture, we can't help but recognize those verses that talk about money. This morning, though, I would like you to reframe your view of stewardship for just a few minutes. Just come along with me a little bit as we think about stewardship not as exclusively about money. And I'd like to do that by going back to our gospel reading from Mark chapter 12. You all have it before you. And as we look at that gospel reading, it's a familiar one, isn't it? Most of you have sat alongside Jesus and the disciples and watched the rich, money, uh, rich people pour their money into the coffers. Many of you have watched as the rich people walked alongside that, that poor widow who only had two mites to her name. Many of you have listened as Jesus has praised this poor widow who gave of her poverty, who gave, did not give of abundance but poverty. Now if we make this all about money, well then we might follow the, well, the path that some folks have before and assume that being rich is a bad thing, a sinful thing, and being poor is a good thing. But that's not what Jesus is trying to say at all, is it? That's not what Jesus is getting at. Look closely at that text. Jesus is praising this woman for her faithfulness. He's praising this woman for giving of her poverty. It's not as though this woman gave of her last two bucks that she had in her wallet for that Sunday or that she searched around right before the offering was passed. She gave all that she had. She gave by stepping out in faith. And if you remember nothing else from this sermon, remember this. Stewardship is about trust. Stewardship is about trust. If you remember nothing else, remember that. Because that woman, that widow, as Jesus praised her, he praised not the money that she gave, but the fact that she gave of all that she had. That she trusted God so much that she was willing to step out in faith. It's interesting, isn't it, that concept of trust. How often it comes up. Our very first commandment, you shall, fear, you shall fear, love, and trust in God above all things. If we could keep the commandment, all the rest would follow. Stewardship would not be an issue for us. But how often does trust fall on ourselves? Fall on the amount of money we have. Fall on the amount of treasures that we have. The amount of things that we can do. 
More often than not, instead of our trust being focused on God, we focus it back in on ourselves. Stewardship requires trust, though. Trust in God. Stewardship, trust in God, begins by looking at what it means to be a steward. We're not renters. We're not borrowers. We're not even owners. Sure, we talk about our money. We talk about our cars and our houses. But when we go back to God's Word, we realize that He calls us stewards because all that we have are gifts from Him. All that we have is from His generosity. We are stewards. That means we care for what God has given us. We are not just mere managers who have no connection whatsoever, but we are those who care for all that God has provided us. And this is nothing new. If we go back to Genesis chapter 1, the very second command that God gave to Adam and Eve was to be good stewards. The first one was be fruitful and multiply. But the next one after that was to have dominion, to rule over his creation. Let me read it to you from Genesis 1.28. And God blessed them. And God said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. We are to subdue, to have dominion over, to rule over God's creation. But to do so as those who care for it. Not to exploit it, to take advantage of what God has given it, but to use it faithfully. To use what God has given us to His honor. But when we view things, if we, as we look at things as if they are ours instead of God's, if we lose sight of the fact that we are stewards, those who care for what God has given us, and we reframe it as we are owners, sometimes it becomes hard to give, to be generous. Sometimes it becomes hard to honor God with what we have. Giving becomes an obligation. The time and the talents that we have, when we start to tally them up, we start to measure how many things we have done we start to say, well, if someone asks one more thing of me, dot, dot, dot. We look at our giving, and maybe we don't ever say this out loud, but maybe we think to ourselves, God's blessed me so I can be faithful right now and, and give. Well, that's not so bad unless we turn it on his head. What happens when the bills are tight? What happens when we don't have a lot of money in the bank? Is God not blessing us then? Has God withdrawn His hand of blessing? Or how often do we compare the time and talents, the treasures that we've given to that which others have given? I know you all are good about this, but there's been people who before who have watched as money was given in the plate and they're kind of looking to see, well, how much did Joe give or something? That's not, again, what we should be doing. But when we put the money in our pocket and we assume it's our money and not God's, we lose, we lose that trust. We lose that faithfulness. And it becomes about us. And it becomes about our worldly comforts and our worldly desires. When we lose sight of being stewards of God's creation, we take advantage of it, we exploit it, and we use it and, and strip it bare without ever caring for it and recognizing what God has given us. The widow, she gave. She gave of her poverty. She stepped out in faith. She gave because she trusted the Lord. Now I've heard people say before, well, no, the widow was more of a nihilist. Well, they didn't use those words, but they, they assumed that she only gave because, well, that's all I have left anyway. Might as well throw it into the God lottery and see if he'll bless me. They didn't use those words again, but that's what it made, they made it sound like. Nihilism says no hope whatsoever. It leaves us wanting. It leaves us empty. Jesus didn't praise her because she threw things up in hope and imagining something would happen. He praised her for her trust. This woman wasn't a nihilist saying, well, this is all I got anyway, might as well take a chance. She knew that God would provide for her. She knew that God would care for her because He had provided for her in the past. He had cared for her in the past. Stewardship is about trusting God, 
trusting that God has provided for us all that we need, even in those times when things seem lean, even in those times when things seem like we don't have all that we need, God is providing for us. This morning, just before the sermon, we confessed the uh, the Apostles' Creed and we said, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. How many times do we go right through that without ever even thinking about the words that we're saying? Well, Luther, he stopped and he asked, what does this mean? Many of you know how the rest of this goes, but I'm going to share with you the second half of it. Because Luther, he hits the nail right on the head. God richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this, it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. Out of divine goodness and mercy. God provides for us all that we need. Luther doesn't assume that's only part of that. Luther doesn't say when we confess those words, the Apostles' Creed, well, well, God will provide a little more after we've done the best we can. He says all of it. Out of his divine goodness and mercy, God provides all we need. For what? Because we deserve it? Well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? What do we deserve from God? Do we deserve his divine goodness and mercy? Do we deserve for him to provide for us everything that we have already and even more? Think about that question for a minute. What do you deserve from God? So often I ask questions and it seems like different people can answer different ways, but in this case, we all can answer the same way. Absolutely nothing. I deserve absolutely nothing from God. You deserve absolutely nothing from God. We don't deserve the gifts we have, the generosity that he has shown to us, his loving kindness and mercy. We do what we do deserve. I guess we do have one thing in common. We deserve eternal punishment and hell. But that is not what he gives us, is it? No, instead, he gives us his divine goodness and mercy. And he does so in such an amazing and wonderful way in the giving of his only son. He gives of all from himself. It's not as though he gave us just gold or silver. He gave of his very self to be Savior. Jesus came to be our Savior. To give us hope, not for tomorrow, but hope for today. Oh, certainly. We look to heaven for that promise that we will one day be in God's kingdom forever. But the hope that we have is a daily hope that God has given to us. That hope that we have is one that Paul talks about in Galatians. No longer are you a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Notice that's a present tense. We are present tense, those inheriting inheriting God's goodness. We are those inheriting God's gifts, God's blessings. As we walk this life's road, we look forward to the day when we will be crowned with God's eternal crown and eternal life. But we also live each day knowing that he provides for every need that we have. We live each day knowing that he has given us more time than we can imagine, even if at times we feel rushed. More talents than we know what to do with. Even if at times we feel like we've run out of things we can do in this world. He can take two mites or ten mites or ten thousand mites. And he can use those to a blessing. He asks of us, trust. Trust in me. Trust that as I have provided for you in the past, that I will continue to provide for you. Trust that I will take care of you. Trust that I am with you always. Trust and have faith. Be willing to take a step out. Recognize that we are stewards. That all these things, they will pass away. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on this earth where raw... where moss and rust and and thieves will uh, well, moss and moth and rust will steal it or destroy it and thieves will steal it, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where you will have an in- internal inheritance. Store up for yourselves those things, that faith, that trust, that hope in God, and He will bless you. He will provide for you beyond compare. Not because we deserve it, not because we merit it or have done something that He has owed us but out of his divine goodness and mercy for us. Stewardship is about trusting God. It's about using our time, 
our money, our talents, our treasures to honor Him so that others too may be blessed as He has blessed us. And we look forward with hope, as John says in Revelations, to receiving that crown of eternal life. May this be the hope God gives you each and every day. May you know that He provides for you always and will even to the day when you rest with Him forever. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to You for Your Son, Christ Jesus, for the ultimate gift, salvation through His name. Lord, help us to look upon that widow and her two mites and and to realize the generosity of heart that she had, the willingness to step out in faith, the willingness to use her last two coins. Lord, so often in this life we worry. We worry about how much money we have. We worry about how much time we have or the way we're using our talents. Help us instead turn to You to know that You have given us more than we can imagine, that You have blessed us abundantly. Use us to use your creation wisely and faithfully. Help us to not exploit your creation, but to use it in honorable ways. Help us to use those gifts not as misers, keeping it for ourselves, but sharing them so that others too may be blessed. Lord, we thank you that from the generosity of your heart, you have given us grace. Your riches at Christ's expense. Your forgiveness, your love, and your promise. Lord, help us to live each day in that promise and in that hope. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.